Hi. Hello. All right. Do you want me to do the intro? Yeah, I forgot to send um, his bio, but that's okay. Wait, are we? Are we? Um, He'll fill on, us sir. in. Yeah, we're recording. I'm just looking up the bio on on uh, Wikipedia. I can send it to you if you want. No, no, I got yeah. it here on Wikipedia. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's just a, you say I'm a columnist, the Guardian, and the contributor to the Nation. Yeah, all right, I'll, I'll get to that. So uh, let yeah. me just start the <laughs> intro then. All right. Yeah. This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM. How was that beep? Right. Hey, you know, somebody, somebody tweeted that, that there's, there's a beep, a constant beep. It's not a constant beep. What is that beep? I have a small alarm. I changed the battery. Go ahead. Do it again, Dan. Change the battery. Okay. Because somebody complained about that. Somebody's complaining now? About the beep. Anyway. This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world-famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Doug. And we're here coming at you via Zoom in quarantine. This is Dan Natterman. Of course, Noam Dorman is here. Didn't feel like doing the introduction today. He's coming at you from an undisclosed location in Westchester County. I'm coming from Manhattan. Uh, we have That's slightly Ashenbrand. disclosed. Oh, go ahead. Pardon? That's slightly <laughs> disclosed. I mean, it's not, go ahead. Uh, Periel Ashenbrand, who is, I forgot where. And our guest tonight is Ross Barkin. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Like Ellen Barkin, but the spelling is different. Different spelling, yeah. Yep. <laughs> a native of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Uh, he's a journalist, staff reporter at Queens Tribune. Uh, he also writes for the New York Observer, and he is a published in his book, uh, he's a Demolition Night, the Guardian. Was published in 2018, and we'll discuss that in a bit. Uh, welcome, everybody. Noam, how are you doing in quarantine? I'm all right. I, I, you know, I, it's, it's, I'm getting a little dark. I don't know. First of all, Periel has coronavirus, according to her. Uh, so I have it already. That, we hope yeah, you guys I still know. have it. I still have it. I'm still in quarantine and I still have it. And we've been talking, this is like the third show that we're talking about this. And Noam just now has realized <laughs> or has accepted the fact that I actually had it. Oh, no, I have not yet accepted the fact that you actually have it. <laughs> I, 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 but maybe you do. Maybe you're one of those barely symptomatic people. If so, you're very lucky. You're very I'm lucky. not barely symptomatic. I'm sick. I haven't, I mean, I feel like shit. Okay, but I'm saying like compared to people who are really suffering, you're, you're you know. Well, I haven't heard I you mean, cough I didn't, once. I couldn't be on a, that's not necessarily a symptom. Uh, what, what, what symptom do you have? I lost my taste and smell about two weeks ago. Um, I'm super achy. I go back and forth with having horrible headaches. If I get up and do something, I'm short of breath. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a real symptom. What, what are you, a medical doctor now? <laughs> All right, let's get on with it. me that Periel likely has it and is fortunate to be relatively mild. Yeah. Yes. Relative, mild. <clears throat> By the way, Noam, uh, with regard to the, uh, Ross, we'll get to you in a bit. We're just doing some house cleaning. Yeah, um, all good. With, with regard to the GoFundMe, uh, it's up to, I believe, 67,000. It's leveling off. It's peaking. We bend, we bend the curve. Yeah, yeah. flatten the We're curve. Bending the curve. If the curve is flattened, I don't think it's gonna, there are going to be too many more donations. I do want to uh, I do want to mention that Il Molino, the restaurant, very famous restaurant, they also have a GoFundMe that somebody put up for their wait staff and bar staff, et cetera. And it's been up for several days and they've only got 7,000 compared to the Comedy Cellar 67,000. So I would just say that the Comedy <laughs> Cellar staff is quite lucky to- uh, I'm not sure per capita uh, what the difference is. We have over a hundred people working. They probably that's have- That's interesting. Get... Although I would imagine Il Molino and I think Il Molino has two locations. I don't know if I don't know if they're owned by the same people, but anyway, we're, we're you know the staff. There's like seventy thousand dollars for the staff, and um and I'm happy about that. I I don't um I don't know their situation, but I'm sure some of them uh uh for some of them that will really be a, a tremendous um help, and for others um you know I I don't know. They're gonna quit. They're gonna get all that money, and then they're just gonna stop working when you open up again. Well, it's not going to be that much money when you divide it amongst all the people that work for Noam. 
I mean, I, we talk about this. I, I, if I, if I could, I'm, first of all, by law, I'm not allowed to, to get involved in that money. Um, if I, if I, if I were to have a hand in distributing it, then um, it would all of a sudden, I, it would be required to, to, it would come under the umbrella of all the laws about a, a corporation distributing money to employees. So I'm not allowed to even advise uh, how it should be distributed. If, for instance, I, if I wanted to give the money, and I would, to a family who um, was struggling as opposed to a waiter who you know, had rich parents, let's say, um, I could get in trouble for discrimination. So, so Birbiglia is going to have to to figure that out. But I hope that the money goes where it's needed, um, and rather uh, rather than just uh, you know mathematically just divvied out. But either way, it'll be helpful, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, to each well, according to need, from each according to his ability. Ross probably probably uh, believes in that. That's uh, probably you're, yeah. You're right for the nation, <laughs> right? Yeah, contributor at the nation, a columnist at the Guardian. Used to work. Queen's Tribune was my, my first stop in uh, 2012. So uh, glad glad that got out there. And New York Observer, where I was a staff reporter for three years, was actually owned by uh, Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner. No, no, uh, semi defunct now. The New York Observer, sadly, but it was once a very good. I, I was reading from Wikipedia. I do apologize. All right. For the date information. It, it runs chronological, so. Yeah. <laughs> so let me tell you why I, I and I I forgive me, I, I had never heard of you, but now you're you're all right. <laughs> you're you're way you're way on my radar. And because um anybody who listens to this podcast know I, I was having a real problem with the um the uh way that everybody was pretending that Governor Cuomo had handled this brilliantly. And I had been complaining in real time it was was happening that they need to close the schools. There's 500 events of 500 or more ridiculous. Half capacity is even more ridiculous. What are we waiting for? The Ohio is already shut down. California, I mean, everything. And then I saw that Cuomo, who does have, and it's not irrelevant to me, an excellent bedside manner. But because his bedside manner was so good and because the, um, I think it is very important psychologically for people to have the good guy Cuomo and the bad guy Trump in some way, um, people just started pretending that he didn't really blow it. And you were the first uh, uh, non-Fox News person. <laughs> and I'm assuming you're pretty left of center, or at least- Pretty, pretty left yeah, pretty left of center, yeah. That's okay, so is Periel. Um, <laughs> uh, that um, you were the first person to just, you know, to say the emperor had no clothes. Like, like, like look, look, look what's happened here. So- um, why don't you why don't you tell us your position on that? Sure. So I, I've covered and followed Andrew Cuomo for a very long time since his first term. He's been governor of New York for almost a decade. Um, you know, I, I've written critically about him for a while. You know, I, I used to have columns the Bill Joyce, so so I covered covered him there as well. Um, you know, I, I my frustration really derived from the fact that, as you said he was getting credit for things that you know other governors were doing and were actually doing sooner um and, and you have you know a president and donald trump who's obviously failed tremendously in the response to coronavirus yeah that's that's inarguable and you have bill de blasio the mayor who's been quite bumbling and, and failed to close the schools in time and was urging people to go to their favorite bars and restaurants and then hours later all businesses in new york city closed going to the Park Slope Y, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he's been a disaster. And in steps Andrew Cuomo, who has really gotten a striking amount of credit for having nothing more than a bedside manner. You know, if you actually look at it, the, the facts of the situation, we closed schools um, and businesses and had a shelter in place order after most other major states that were grappling with COVID-19, whether it was Ohio, Michigan, California, Washington State, you know, there are governors you want to praise here. I would say Jay Inslee in Washington, Gavin Newsom, Mike DeWine, who's a Republican in Ohio, those all come to mind. And, and Cuomo not only was not ahead of the curve, in fact, he was slightly behind the curve. And, and tragically with coronavirus, if you're slightly behind the curve, this means a lot of people are going to die. And it's no accident that New York is the epicenter of this. And yes, density plays a role. 
Yes, certainly we're testing aggressively, but testing and density don't explain the fact that in New York City now, there are, um, I'm, I'm trying, the death count just ch changes every day. So I don't have the exact number in front of me, but you know, more New York City residents have now died than in September 11th. You know, the number climbs every day and there are just so many more deaths and so 4, many 4,571, according to the Times right now. Yeah, four, right. And, and it'll be higher tomorrow. It'll probably eclipse 5,000 actually, actually, they're saying that it's even now much higher than that because that number does not take account all of the people who have died at home yep. that are likely a result of COVID-19. So right, it's actually... Right. So yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's in the 5,000 range for sure. So go ahead, continue. Okay. So it, it's, it's been a catastrophe. I mean, there, there's, there's no way to argue if you actually look at the facts that New York handled this well. And that's really been where a lot of my criticism has come from. If Andrew Cuomo was being held to the same standard as Bill de Blasio and as Donald Trump, it'd be like oh, one more executive who screwed this up, join, join the club, right? But he's not joining the club. He's a nationally famous, renowned governor now with approval ratings over 70%. So it, it's just, to me at least, and, and, and my own view of this and how I, I've covered this, it's entirely unwarranted. And it, it's frustrating as a New Yorker. I grew up here, born and raised in Brooklyn. So uh, it, it's a tragedy. I mean, this is a, a mass tragedy that has now exceeded September 11th, um, and in some ways is a scary in a different way. And Cuomo has completely failed to contain it. There's no other way to put it right I now. I think there's a sense that at least Cuomo did his best, even if his best was woefully inadequate. And people attribute to Trump, people I've talked to anyway, attribute to Trump uh, nefarious motives. Uh, uh, he, they, they attribute to, well, one friend in particular that I was talking to who feels that Trump simply was putting his electoral interests above the good of the country. And so he felt, well, you know, uh, he needed to downplay this. Um, because he didn't really care if anybody died as long as he could protect his image and his chances for re-election. All right, I, I think that's kind of madness, but let me, let me just, so let me, so I, I think was- there is a sense that, that Cuomo did his best. Yeah, well, listen, I don't hate Cuomo, and I, and I just to get ahead of myself, I think that if, um, if, if I had to choose the person who would be best able to handle this situation next year in New York, I might say Cuomo, assuming that people make mistakes and, and, and can learn a lot from them. Um, he certainly uh, knows a lot about this now and probably wouldn't make the same mistakes twice. But I, let me just, so let me just present this. So the New York Times today, now I, I have a lot of issues with the bias of the New York Times because they, they pick and choose and especially their editorial, editorial page. But it's still the only place or one of the only places to really get a thorough, uh, you know, uh, what, what's the word? It's not dissertation. Anyway, a, a thorough accounting of top to bottom of something that's gone on. It is still the paper of record in that way. And they did a very, very thorough thing about the New York's response today. And to their credit, to their credit, it says, and I can, I can, I can, I can share it so you can see it says shockingly i don't know i don't know if ross has seen this yet yes i have yes it says uh dr Fre dr Fre uh frieden said that this is a, their expert they were quoting if the state and city had adopted widespread social distancing measures a week or two earlier including closing schools stores and restaurants all the things which we had been saying they should do then the estimated death toll from the outbreak might have been reduced by 50 to 80 percent Jesus Christ. 50 to 80%. Now, now and, and I had a lot of thoughts about this. First of all, I will criticize the Times because despite the fact that they printed this story, I somehow think if they did an analysis of the federal government and came to, they buried the lead. The headline to this story should have been, experts say that Cuomo's delay uh, caused 50 to 80% times the deaths in New York. That's the natural headline of this story. And they bury it halfway down the story. There's no question that if the Times had concluded that Donald Trump was responsible for 80% more deaths or 50% more deaths than what we've seen, 
that would be the lead story on every um, cable, except for Fox, every, every cable network in the country tonight. And yet it's barely known about Cuomo. So the, so the wagons are yet being circled. And, and that, that, really, that really bothers me. Um, I don't know if Ross wants to say anything. Yeah, no, I, 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 you, you actually brought up the part in that article that, that I was going to bring up, which is, yes, I mean, if that's the crux of the matter, you could really stop reading after that. Uh, Tom Frieden, former head of the CDC, former health, health uh, department commissioner in New York City, said something that a lot of experts agree with. It's something I, I've long felt and sensed. I, I don't have the expertise to come up with such a figure that I'd be talking out of, out of my, you know, you know, what if I did that, but, um, you know, 50 to 80%. And, and, it, and it's, it's very striking. And when you're talking about something like, uh, like coronavirus, which is highly, highly contagious every day, every hour counts. So to give you an example, California did a shelter in place order mass shutdown in the state almost one week before New York did. And California had far less confirmed cases in New York. In fact, it was actually the bumbling Bill de Blasio who first suggested the shelter in, in, um, in place order. I think it was around that March 16th time. I'd, I'd have to double check. So you have de Blasio suggesting we should do this. Cuomo actually overruled him. You can go back and look at and, and said at the time, we have no plans to do this right now. If we did it, it'd be statewide. We're not doing it in New York City. So in part because he, he's not a big fan of the mayor, um, he delayed this order by many days, then finally did what we're calling in New York the pause order, which is just shelter in place with Cuomo. Cuomo loves acronyms and loves name, naming things, so he can have credit for them. Um, we got this pause order around March 22nd. So we were days behind states that had far less severe outbreaks that were not necessarily ticking time bombs for coronavirus. You think of California, you have cities that are a bit less dense, people drive their cars more. New York City really was always going to be a place that will probably get hit fairly hard. But the issue is, how hard would we get hit? Could you mitigate some of the worst effects? And it's inarguable to me, at least, that um, Andrew Cuomo failed miserably to mitigate the worst effects. We are living in the worst case scenario of coronavirus um, that we could have faced. We are Italy. We have more, New York State, I believe now, has more confirmed COVID-19 cases than Italy, the nation of Italy. And that is a, a stunning statistic. So what do you attribute Cuomo's, uh, you know, his, his, his actions? Uh, what? Pardon? <laughs> We're both in front of the bridge. Well, we're both coming ben at you from changed his back the same location. <laughs> it's all right. We can both be by the bridge. It's a nice what, bridge. What, what it looks you, like you're holding hands from where I'm sitting, but go ahead. What do you attribute that to? I mean, wishful thinking. Um, you know, no, no one, had no one been the mayor, no one probably would have shut it down because no one was, was, was locked up in his house a week prior to... Uh, to oh, uh, 10 days. Ten days prior to uh, the shot to the, I might have been there two weeks. I had the kids to finally, uh, but yeah. I mean, why do you think Cuomo was 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 slow on that? I, I I think he and De Blasio each wanted to project a sense of calm in the city, which it turned out was was a horrible idea. You know, if you look at quotes from De Blasio and Cuomo, really in that first week of March, you can look at these press conferences. Each of them were talking about the fear being worse than the reality. Um, the, the, the Cuomo was saying around March 5th, you know, I'm going to keep shaking hands. You know, I, I'm a politician. This is what I do. Um, you know, de Blasio saying we have to go on, go, go about our lives as normal. I think for both of them, they wanted to project this sense of calm, which if it's in different sorts of disasters and maybe something you do, right? This was not one of those disasters. So you start with two politicians who wanted to reassure people yes you can go on the subway yes you can go to the bodega yes you can go to the bar hang out with your friends yes you can go to parties when in fact it was a lie you could not do any of those things yes truthfully we should have shut the whole thing down on march 1st which is the day of the first confirmed case that should have been the day Obviously, cuomo if he had yeah. a crystal ball he would have done things differently so he he didn't realize that it would it would uh, there be this many cases obviously he, he yeah he i mean 
I agree. He didn't believe the science or he was, he didn't want to believe the science. It's yeah. And I would just say in the only thing I would say in both their defenses, it, it is a tough decision to make to close public schools, to close businesses. You're doing extreme economic damage to the state, but so, you have to do it to save lives. So, so, so let me, let me say, politicians a few things. don't want to do that. By the way, Ross, you're a terrific guest. I hope I hope we get you again in the in the future when we, we I'm available. Want. I'm at home. I'm I'm uh, inside a lot. So because we're I'm like, sure it won't be too long before we, we before we have something we we really disagree <laughs> on. As a matter of fact, I might be able to give you something today we really disagree on. But while we're agreeing, so first of all, as to the question of what Cuomo is thinking, I think we have a a a clue here. This is an article in the Hill that I noticed, and it says uh, Andrew Cuomo to emerging coronavirus hotspots make harder choices sooner. And in, among the articles, it, it says um, he advocates paying attention to numerical projections against hopeful intuition. So what I get from that is he's kind of telegraphing that he gets it, that he, that he, that he was late, on, late to the game. And seems to me the insight is that um, he just couldn't believe it, which is, you know, which I think is human nature. It, I think you have to be once bitten to be twice shy. Over, overwhelmingly, most people need that. And that's why Asia has been much quicker on this. And there are some great people who are able to not need that, but it seems to be a part of human nature that you just can't believe it. And you know, going further, Churchill, we needed a Churchill, right? Someone to, to, who, who was gonna spell it out. But the truth was, Churchill was not heated in his day. He was dismissed. And um, it's not clear to me that what, what would have happened if Cuomo had actually shut everything down on March 1st. You know, he would have had a tough time of it. The country was not going to, and, and if he succeeded, then he really could never prove that he succeeded. You, you know, people say, well, what did you do? Nothing happened. You, you, you killed our economy for nothing. So he was in a tough spot. He was in Roy Scheider's spot as the sheriff in Jaws, you know, shutting down the beaches. But um, in the end, he got it wrong. Let me say a couple other quick things. So he says, uh, they're in, that, in that article in the Times, where did I put it? Um, there's another thing that I really didn't like. And he says here, um, it says, for Mr. de Blasio, and this is typical of the Times, for Mr. de Blasio, whose progressive political identity has defined has been defined by his attention to the city's have-nots. The crisis presented a stark and unwelcome choice to harm some New Yorkers in order to save others. I'm like, what the fuck are they talking about? First of all, do they really think that the have-nots, which I guess in New York are mostly you know, minorities, Blacks and Hispanics, wanted their kids to be going to school while it was death? These, these, these minority homes that are multi-generational this was, they, they would feel like closing the schools was, um, what, was saving others at, at their expense. Of course, this is not at their expense. And, and then, you know, like just to, to put a finer point at it, on it, so there's an article in Time Magazine, which says, here it is, data suggests many New York City neighborhoods hardest hit by COVID-19 are low-income areas. So in... In this, um, is that, did I share that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this, in this attempt to help minorities, they fucking killed them. They killed them. Uh, uh, so I don't, you know, it just, it makes me furious because of course they are living closer together and they are living in housing projects where, where social distancing is um, not practical and they are less, Forgive me, they are less sophisticated in certain ways. They're not reading the New York Times uh, maybe as much as some other people. Maybe they didn't get the message or maybe they're more naive. I don't know whatever it is, but the idea- Well, they also don't have the luxury of staying home. Staying home like is a luxury, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. First of all, I don't know that that's true because- It is true. Of course it's true. Well, I mean, listen, let's just speak honestly here. First of all, a lot of poor people are home. A lot of people, poor people don't work or they're living on government assistance, or they have their grandparents living with them who are staying with them. I mean, I know, I've known a lot of people, my wife is one who grew up very poor, who grew up in housing projects and grew in Brooklyn. And um, I'm not sure, I'm, sh I mean, I'm sure for plenty of people, there's nobody home, but there's a lot of them who, who are home. And then, yes, it might, they might have to figure out how to do it, but are you helping them by 
killing them? By no, putting of them course in not. So that's so what, what I'm saying is that for de Blasio to be to say that he was harming one segment on the backs of another segment, he got that so wrong because it's that other segment that's dying more. They're the ones he really harmed. The rich people, we're able to stay home, you know, and, and, and we're, you know, economically damaged until the checks come in from the government. And the poor people are dying. And the poor and people also are dying. a lot of wealthy people left the city. I, I don't know if you're making excuses for it. I think it's inexcusable. Me? So I, don't know what, I, don't, I don't know what well, I don't is. think he anticipated that outcome. I think he would agree with you, given what's happened. But at the time, he didn't anticipate the, the toll that it would take the, uh, on, the, on the minority community. And, and why, why didn't, but what I'm saying is, that why do they, why is everything become, I'm going to sound like a cliche here. Why does everything come down to an identity politics thing? We as humans, we're all equally threatened with death by this virus. And death, that comes first. Everything else becomes irrelevant at that point. If you're worried about the poor people not being able to stay home, then get some way for them to be fed. You know, take care of them. I agree. But you don't help them by sending them off saying, go out, have a good time. Don't worry about anything. 100%. You're absolutely right. We'll bury you in Central Park. It's just, you know. Are they burying people in Central Park? They're putting the bodies there right now. I want to be very clear. I think de Blasio is a fucking nightmare, and I agree with you now. Except, and, and maybe Ross can correct me here if I'm wrong, I don't think that there was any decision that uh, Cuomo could not have overruled. Is that correct? Well, so, so yeah, so a few points. One, yes, the, the state has an inordinate power of the city. Andrew Cuomo can effectively overrule de Blasio in almost anything, practically speaking. So he can choose to shut the schools and do a statewide order if de Blasio doesn't want to do it. I mean, in, in terms of who, who's working, yeah, I, I would just counter and say a lot of the, the poor in the city are, are working in the grocery stores, minimum wage jobs, essential workers. You also have a, a vast working class, transit operators, you know, the, a lot of people who now are still have to go to work. Yeah, let, let me, let me um, just... Let me just interrupt you. Just yeah. I am not saying for a second that poor people don't work. Yeah, I was just, I was just saying. Yeah, the, I just, I just saying the idea that that uh, you know, that 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 every nobody's home. I think in a lot of poor households, there a lot of there are plenty. There are people who actually are home because grandparents often live with them because for whatever reason. The, the poor people who are working, first of all, they are our heroes right now. They're delivering groceries and all this kind of stuff. We, 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 where would we be without them? But. Uh, for them, I just want to make the point that it is not, it was, it was cruel to them. And it was just kind of, it's this kind of elitist. Can, can I digress for a second, Ross, without you going crazy? Go ahead. Yeah, digress. Because this is what reminds me of. So you have the issue of um, voter ID rules, right? Now, I, I, I don't care. I'm, I don't have a big opinion on whether these laws are a good idea, bad idea, suppress. I know Vox did a thing where they actually said it doesn't suppress turnout. Beside the point to me. That's not what I'm, I'm bringing it up for. But what I've always felt uncomfortable about is the casual way we make the argument, well, you know, you can't really expect black people to get IDs like everybody else. It's just so condescending to me. It's just this white elitist, I don't know if they, they realize it. Like I, I own a bar, every black person has an ID. I mean, if, if this is really true, then maybe we need to consider driver's licenses because that's a lot more important to somebody's life than getting an ID to vote. And maybe, uh, we, maybe they can't fly on airplanes now as easily as other people do because they need ID to fly on airplanes. Like, like how little do we think of black people or minority people that we think, well, to require them to do the same thing that everybody does is somehow racist. And you know, so, so that, that, that the ease with which that mentality is out there has always given me pause. Like if I was going to make the case that no, you can't, there, it's not fair for them to get IDs. I would all of a sudden start, that would catch in my throat because I'd be spinning out of my head. Like, what am I really saying here? That my black friends can't get, or my black, the black families I know can't get the same ID that the white family can. So maybe it's true. You know, maybe empirically that, that is a true fact. But it's, 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 it's dangerous to me. And I feel that it's somehow related to this notion, well, the, the minorities, how can, they, how can they possibly handle uh, close, you know, taking care of their kids and closing the schools? Like, how can they do that? I just, I just have, I sound corny. 
I don't think they're that different in terms of common sense and being resourceful as anyone else. I think, and, I, and look, the proof is in the pudding. They are home now, and they do seem to be managing, right? I haven't heard a well, lot of horror stories. Jump in, uh, with your uh, question that you had uh, asked if Cuomo has a right to overrule de Blasio. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. I, I think it's a lot like yes, the comedy seller. Noam has the right to overrule Esty. He never does it. Oh, that's not true. Of course well, I would. Cuomo overrules de Blasio a lot. That, that happens a lot in, in, in New York. Uh, politics, actually. He, he okay. shut the subways down once during a snowstorm without telling. The point is, there's, there's, there's this issue of not wanting to That's amazing, really? Yeah, right. in 2015, uh, over the threat of a snowstorm, the, the subway system, when, when the only time was ever shut down, was, was shut down on Cuomo's orders, and, and he didn't tell uh, de Blasio before he did it, because he controls the subway system. That's a perfect the example. Imagine, imagine de Blasio said, uh, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna have a snow day for school, Somebody else said, it. we're not going to have a snow day for the snowstorm. We're going to send everybody to school because it's not fair to the poor people to have to stay home in the snowstorm. So we're going to send them to school and buses and let them, you know, let them get into car accidents. And a snowstorm is nothing compared to the coronavirus. Nothing. Like, but they close the schools. They don't assume this is the end of the world for poor people if there's a snowstorm and everybody's home for five days. Look, the truth right? is, is that everybody dropped the ball, and you've been saying this from the beginning, is that nobody really knew what to do or how to deal with it. No, I didn't say they didn't know what to do. Everybody knew what to do. No, you said that in Asia they're so much more prepared because they've lived through this before. No, I said that, 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 it's, that they, they, ref they were in denial about what to do, but Okay. They knew what to. So, by the way, Ross, do you like Christopher Hitchens? Old Christopher Hitchens? Yeah, no, I, I find I find him interesting. I, and he's a supporter of the Iraq War, which I, I'm not. I, that's why I said very old. much against. But he certainly was a very important intellectual and fascinating figure. So, so yeah, so not anti Hitch. I'm going to give you a great Christopher Hitchens quote that I found sure. uh, last night. I was reading him for something totally unrelated. It was it was an interview he did about his mother Teresa thing. And uh, I, I, I want to buzz it. As to why those who would normally consider themselves rationalists, this guy formed blah, 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 Mother Teresa myth. You know, he hated Mother Teresa. And then at the end he says, and this really reminded me of our current situation. Then also there is the general problem of credulity of people being willing once, of being willing once a reputation has been established, and this is beautiful, to judge people's actions by that reputation instead of the reputation by that action. And I think that's exactly what, he hit the nail on the head of what, exactly what's going on with Cuomo. Because of his reputation, they're going soft on his action rather than judging the reputation based on the action. So, so the, the irony of Andrew Cuomo is if you follow him a bit, he has a reputation for being an authoritarian in some sense. He has governor, a heavy handed governor, very much a fan of executive power, uh, strong arming the legislature. The, the irony here is Cuomo did not act like an authoritarian when it came to COVID-19. And if there was one time we did need a bit of an authoritarian as governor, it was this time. It, it was the type of governor who would say, no, we are going to close the schools. No, we are going to shut down businesses. No, we are going to go into full shelter in place and, and, and damn public opinion. That, that's the kind of attitude you needed. And the irony is Cuomo did not rise to the occasion of being the authoritarian of reputation. He did not act like one. He dithered. Um, and you have other governors who don't have that reputation. Jay Inslee in Washington State, Gavin Newsom in California, Gretchen Whitmer, newly elected governor in, in Michigan. And New, uh, New York, unlike other places, did have time to prepare and have time to see this coming. Wuhan was in December and January. There was no reason to think a city like New York, an international city, would not become an epicenter. We had several months of lead time. This, the outbreak first came in Washington State, so we could watch them struggle with it first. Um, so in that sense, you know, there, there's no excuse. On, 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 on the school closure thing, quickly, where de Blasio was coming from, I think he was misguided, though I, I get it. It's hard to shut down a school system. You know, you're talking about uh, you know, over a million school kids educated. A lot of parents don't have child care options. A lot of parents have to work multiple jobs. It's, it's a big decision. That being said, you've got to save lives. You've got to do it and figure out the rest later because, yes, people are dying, and it is – now, sadly, it's New York's working class and poor, Latinos, 
African Americans, they, they are being hit hardest by this because they they be, because they tend to be lower income, um, they can't leave the city, and also it's harder for them to to easily isolate, right? If you live in a crowded apartment, you're living with family, if you don't have a backyard, if you're not a homeowner, much easier for the wealthy to follow all of the guidelines to hoard food, to hoard supplies. The wealthier you are, the more easy it is to ride out COVID-19. And the poorer you are, sadly, it's harder. It's just, it just physically harder Awful. harder to avoid going to work. These telecommuting jobs like my own, I can do journalism remotely. I can teach college. I teach at NYU. I can do that remotely. These are white collar professional jobs, but those blue collar working class jobs, person to person stuff, you, you can't, you can't do that remotely. You can't operate a train remotely. You can't drive a sanitation truck remotely. You can't bag at Christie's or at Key Food remotely either. But well, while we're talking 100%, about things, one hundred percent correct, one hundred percent correct. I, I agree with you, Go ahead, Dan. While well, we're talking about things that 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 uh, Cuomo should have done two weeks sooner, is there anything today that he's not doing that in two weeks' time will be saying he should have done that two weeks sooner? Um, good question. So I, I think as of today, he is acting aggressively. I, I can't criticize you know, keeping the, the full shutdown and order in place, enforcing social distancing. I would say that the big mistake being made right now, and this is on more Mayor Bill de Blasio, is not shutting down more streets that are not being actively used so people who do go outside for exercise can walk in the street and effectively social distance. It's very hard on these crowded sidewalks to get your exercise and social distance. We all have to go outside occasionally, it's human nature, but right now de Blasio is refusing. He did a pilot program, then he just nixed it. Um, you know, it, it, it's ridiculous. You've less cars on the road. It, it, it would be very easy to do. Though. In you Italy, can... and in, you, you would need a piece of paper saying that you are going to the grocery store or you're going to the pharmacy or you're walking your dog. And other than that, you did not go the fuck outside. Like, I, I don't understand. People, I mean, are gallivanting around the city streets, going on bike rides, going on walks. I mean, you still see, they just closed the playgrounds a few days ago. Yeah, we were I too mean, slow to do that, for the sure. The subways well, let me ask, are, let me ask you this. turned into, like, an insane asylum. So, Ross, let me ask you this. Is, yeah. it, is this incorrect? And then I, I feel this way. Is, this, is, is the following incorrect? That so long as... The, the healthcare system is not overrun. Uh, they probably don't want it to go down to zero. There is some there is some advantage to having a slow, controlled stream of people who are getting this and recovering. Is that correct? In order to help to help us afterwards. Um, it's a good question, Neil. I mean, I, right right now. I mean, you're, you're so far away from getting it to zero. I mean, the biggest thing is you've heard the term a million times is flatten the curve. So people, you know, the, eventually a lot of people are going to get coronavirus and the hope is that you flatten it enough where it becomes something like the flu and then a vaccine arrives and most people recover and you don't overwhelm the hospitals. So what would the reason be that they're still holding back uncertain measures. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn. The economy is not like there's any much marginal, more yeah. damage they can do. The, so why would, I would just, and I think you already convinced me that I was wrong about what I just said, but I'm just saying, the, why are they holding back on these measures? Um, you know, in terms of the, the Italy question, it, that it maybe it's a matter of logistics at this point. Um, the street closures, I don't know. I'm perplexed by that. It seems like an obvious thing to do. Just let people safely, if they do go outside, they can safely avoid each other and just go into the street. I understand you have emergency vehicles coming to the street. You can do side streets. You can leave big avenues open. In terms of the other measure, measures, I mean, we do have a pretty hard uh, shutdown order in statewide. I mean, the, the big thing now that I think New York is trying to do is get testing um, ramped up eventually. So one day you can test lots of people and really see who's still healthy, who's not isolate people. We're still a long way from that. They don't want to have people come in and test because they don't have the capacity to do it right now. I mean, the big mistake I think Cuomo made. I, I think, go ahead. Is, I, yeah. Go ahead. I, 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 think, I, I think I just thought of the reason. Go ahead. 
yeah, you you, you asked me before, like, what's a thing that we're going to say, ah, oh, that was a mistake. It, this was more in the budget that just got passed. Cuomo cut Medicaid funding to hospitals, to public hospitals in particular, that are already extremely cash strapped. They run deficits. They've got poor patients who don't have health insurance or they have Medicaid. So cutting funding to them, which is something Cuomo for, you know, for a long time has wanted to um, slow New York's Medicaid spending. Um, so I think that was a mistake, cutting the hospital funding in a time of crisis. You know, I, I don't think it's a good idea anyway, but if it's something you want to address during peacetime, address it in peacetime. We're at war right now. You can't be cheap during war. You see Congress just passed a $2, two trillion dollar stimulus, so we're going to go back from war. You, you gotta, you've got to do everything you can. I mean, you're at war with this massive unseen enemy. Right. So. so that's so, a mistake Cuomo has, has made. So, then, wait, so this, wait, let me yeah. say this. So this is what I, I, it occurred to me. And I, I, this makes sense to me. If they started opening the streets, I think they would, they would worry about sending the message that they're encouraging people to go out. And before you know it, those new streets open would become crowded. Because that's what usually happens when they, when they, when they open you know, more room. It just people file in and, and, and fill it up to, to the limit of how close they're ready to get to each other. So I could see maybe so we don't want to, and maybe there was a pilot program and that's what they found. Like we started opening more streets and people just started flooding out into those they, streets. They, they claim the, the, the reasoning behind the pilot program being mixed was that the, de Blasio didn't want to deploy um, NYPD for that function. That, that's what he gave. You may be right. Maybe it sends a wrong message. Yeah. Um, I think it, it just may be a common sense thing to do because there are people who are going to leave their homes and try to social distance. Um, you know, right, right now, you know, you, you have to be very harsh. There's no doubt about it. Maybe, you know, fines did get increased for failing to social distance. I would personally like to see, if you're asking me things we should be doing, um, more, more regimented use of grocery stores, maybe, you know, really hardly regulating how many people go in, have set times, maybe, I don't know, this is complicated, set times where people living on certain blocks can shop, then a different block, you go in at this time, um, maybe some degree of rationing of certain supplies if there are runs on certain supplies. Uh, you know, these are sorts of things that are, that are hard to do. Uh, but I would ideally like to see because going to a grocery store, going to a pharmacy, it's still such a hazard and you really want to be um, effectively using these places and not letting them get too crowded. So if there are ways the city can be more creative about it, they should. Um, I, I will say, as of today, Cuomo and de Blasio are taking it very seriously. They are. The problem is it's too little, too late. People are dying. And that's the I, real I have just a couple points to make about people walking in the streets. Go ahead, Dan. Street closures. And well, well, I haven't been out very often. When I go out, I have really very little problem walking in the street and avoiding people. Um, you know, when I see people coming at me. They walk the away. <laughs> on the sidewalk. Typically, the streets aren't very crowded these days. So I'll usually walk into the street and uh, avoid them. What I have a problem is, is um, like, you know, going into a store and then somebody's coming the other way in the, in the, in the, in the aisle. Yeah, that's dicey. Uh, that's dicey. But that's also, dicey. how dangerous is it? And I guess the answer is you don't know, I don't know, and nobody else knows. How dangerous is, is it to be walking in the street with other people walking in the street? Uh, from what I've read is, and it may be completely wrong, is that getting, uh, getting this virus is difficult in an outdoor setting, just walking past somebody. That's an unlikely way that you're going to get it. It's harder. Um, my caution with coronavirus is you, at this point, because there are things we don't know, assume it's even more contagious than you think and assume that you can get it from anyone and get it almost anywhere. That, that, that's just something that, that I, given the amount of information that's come out, given how things change, how long is it airborne, how long does it live on surfaces, the safest thing you can do is assume it's everywhere, assume everyone has it and keep your distance. So yeah, outdoor versus indoor, is it less likely if you pass someone and they don't like sneeze on you or, or let out a fluid? Sure. No, because they're uh, saying now that there are micro droplets. They're saying now that there are micro droplets that are in the air that can yeah. stay there for up to three hours. Yeah, but yeah. less likely outdoors. To get less no, likely. that's not true. All right, but they also don't know that it's 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 that you can re that you'll get it from that. that Look, you know, we don't know. I mean, that, that's the thing. Concentration and certain number of viruses and 
a certain exposure to it in a confined area, I, from what I've read, but again, nobody really knows. You're, uh, you're playing the odds. If, 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 they, if they could graph the mechanism that every single person who had coronavirus got it, there would be these small half of 1%, one-tenth of 1%, event, and that might be the person who got it walking around outside, the person who got it from the pizza. That you know, These are very unlikely ways to catch it. I think overwhelmingly you catch it by being in close proximity to somebody who can breathe on you, probably indoors, you know, or touching your face in all these ways. But why would you want to take any risks? You know, let's say it's a 1% chance. That's one out of 100 so, so if you pass a hundred people, now you're you're in the ballpark of of catching it, and one out one out of a what is it? One out of a hundred people have it in New York, right? Approximately. It, I mean, to admit, with this, I mean, the, the truth is, whatever whatever the the confirmed number of cases is, right, and the number changes nightly, it goes up and up and up. We have to assume way more have it. We we have to assume more people died of it. We have to assume because people aren't getting tested anymore. New York, again, part of the very discombobulated response and messaging. If you recall, in the early days, it was get tested, get tested. We're doing the, the, the mobile testing sites, they the drive through a new Rochelle, get tested, get tested. And then overnight they realized we don't have, we can't do this. People are, are sick anyway, and we can't use resources to test. In an ideal world, you would do mass testing and you would identify the sick people and quarantine them. That's what the functioning nations do. That's what has been done in, um, in, in certain other, I think it was, uh, I think Taiwan and Singapore, that's really what they did. Um, also but, New Zealand. But, yeah, yeah, you know, you, you make actually a really interesting point. Just, I, I hadn't thought about it that way, which is that the half measures don't work. The, the testing, uh, when you can't do a mass testing. It's sort of pointless. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not completely pointless, but it only gets yeah. you so far. It gets you so far because now that th we've, we've been testing more, but there are just so many people who haven't been tested, who are sick, who have symptoms. Who but in the next, haven't. but a month from now, if they get this 15 minute test and there's millions of them, then they could maybe devise a strategy of allowing people uh, you know, we're like making making sure everybody gets the test and right. You know, so many people sure, will have following died people. By then. I don't know what's that. So many people will have died by then. You you, you are. I, I think you know. Noam's right. You are going to want to reach a point at some point where you can mass test people. But yeah, now isn't the time to do it because we don't we don't have the resources to do it. But yes, at some point, as you try to reopen the economy and return to normal, which we all want to do. You, I, you would try to mass test people so you can identify who has antibodies, who had it, who may be recovered, who's still sick, and then you can effectively isolate those people until they get better. But we're not at that point. Right now, we're at the point of triage. We're at the point of war. People are still dying, and people got to stay home. And, and there's not really much else we can do. But so, okay, let's talk, let's talk about Trump. What's that, what's that Perio? I thought that they also are really desperate for people who have had it and have recovered to donate yes. plasma now, right? That's that's starting up, yes. So so that will be beginning and, and, and hopefully will bear fruit. We're in the very early stages of that though. So, you know, we'll see where that goes and if that can be helpful. But yes, that that's something that is beginning to happen and maybe is, is a ray of uh, hope in, in a very dark uh, moment. Periel, are you confident enough that you have this and after you're fully recovered, you're ready to go out there without worrying about getting it anymore? Well, my doctor told me that because they don't know enough about it, um, in theory, you still need to be very careful because they don't know how. So when you get something like this, you develop antibodies, which one would think that then you can't get reinfected, but they don't know how many antibodies you need. So it's really up in the air. Right. Yeah, I mean, we just don't know enough. I mean, that's the, we just don't know enough about, about it, this we at all. We don't have enough don't information. Know. So we'll get more, but not now. I brought but the you, point a couple of weeks ago that that was uh, I don't I, I don't felt I don't feel was adequately uh, listened to, where some people are actually uh, getting a mood boost from uh, from this, and and there was an article. Um, I forgot where it was, but I saw it. How 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 a lot of therapists are seeing some of their depressed patients actually. Uh, feeling better uh, because now everybody's in their in the same boat. Um, you know, um, I spoke to somebody who 
is actually his, his wife was wanted to have a uh, what's that IVF or whatever you know in vitro in fertilization, vitro fertilization yeah. Yeah, and and he was and and he it was stressful for him and now they can't do it and so he's like good you know some people like the at home time um, so for various reasons some people are uh, actually getting getting I, this is not most people but th that phenomenon does exist that that Fo FOMO people. is dead so what? yes. It FOMO, fear missing out, it, it's officially dead. You, you cannot have FOMO right now. So maybe that helps people psychologically that they're literally nothing you can miss out on. There's no party going on that you weren't invited to, no bar invites that you're missing out on, no, no ball games you're not getting to. There, there's literally nothing going on. Vote for Cuomo, not the FOMO. Remember? <laughs> well, I remember, yes. <laughs> well, Addy, you don't remember. 1977. Addy, Addy, yeah. Addy. I called you Addy because there's an Addy barking too. Yes, there is an Addy. No relation, but yeah, he's, he's more famous than me. He's more Twitter popular. So let's talk about Trump. Um, Do it. Uh, what, what, is, what is the biggest mistake he made, he really made, and what, would, what is the consequence? Uh, not not ramping up testing and ignoring it for a long time. He he sensed and, and you know to some extent he was right that this was going to probably be bad for him and that it's going to tank the economy. Um, and and his entire reelection argument was based on the economy. So he downplayed, ignored it forever. That that sets its tone right off the bat. People in America take things less seriously if the president takes it less seriously not ramping up testing, not ramping up supplies. You're talking about, we, we've had shortages of everything. We've been so flat footed on this. Um, and now the United States is becoming a global epicenter for COVID-19. So um, he defunded the, the, the CDC. You know, that, you go up and down really the list. That's true, the CDC. Yeah, that's been some fact checks I read, but, but go on, I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I would say generally, he, like a lot of conservatives, he, he's had taken a very hostile view toward bureaucracy, um, towards the administrative state, as Steve Bannon would call it. So in no way was, I would say for him, was a well-funded, effective government necessarily a priority. It, it's not within the ideology that he is operating from, or at least the people around him are operating from. So, so let, me, let me poorly, push, poorly prepared for this. I mean, let me push was. back on that uh, just for you know sake of argument. But Dan, you want to say something? Well, in terms of not tanking the economy, certainly this has tanked the economy. The economy would have been less tanked had he acted soon. Had he prepared? That's the irony of it. Had he prepared the economy? Yes, perhaps we would not be going to a mass shutdown, or maybe we would anyway. But less people would have died because we would have done it sooner. I mean, other countries are in are in a state of mass shutdown too. So we're not alone in this. But could could you have saved lives? Yes, you you could have saved. Well, lives. So, let, so, so let me go ahead. Dan, well, my, was my friend's accusation that I spoke with last week fair that? Trump was indifferent to human life, prioritizing his electoral uh, and, and his 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 um, chances of reelection over human life, which Noam thought was ridiculous. But that accusation was made by a friend of mine. Do you think that's a credible accusation? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's a it's a hard one to make. Um, I, I don't I don't I can't get inside of Trump's head and 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 make that that you know make that hot a take. I guess I would say. But what I would say is I think Trump is someone who thinks a lot about his reelection prospects and where he is in the polls. This is something he talks about all the time. He's very obsessed with it. He's obsessed with, with his ratings, kind of his standing. So, you know, he, he, he for a long time was refusing to talk about coronavirus. You know, this was raging in January. It, it would not even be addressed. You know, he downplayed it repeatedly. Okay, actually, let me, let me stop you there because it, it's, a good, it's a good entry point for what I want to say. So... And, and I'm going to say, let me preface it with something that might make your eyes roll, but I, I actually believe this. The president has had a lot of trouble keeping anything a secret within his administration. He, he says something to three people in the Oval Office and it leaks out. He has a call with the president of Ukraine where he talks about investigating Biden. It, it leaks out. There's a million examples of conversation with Putin. It leaks out. He, He's, I have to believe that he is very much following the advice of the medical team around him. Because I can't believe if there was some conversation where a doctor said to Mr. President, if you don't do this, people are gonna die. And he said, well, I'm not doing it. 
I can't believe that these doctors who have taken these kind of oaths would not find a way to leak that out to the press. Well, and almost, a, and then for instance, there is this, you said January, and that's why I wanted to use it. So in January, um, you have this dude saying the following, right? Um, and I'm not crazy. So, uh, manageable numbers. Um, bottom line, we don't have to worry about this one, right? Well, I, you know, obviously you need to take it seriously and do the kinds of things that the CDC and the Department of Homeland Security are doing. But this is not a major threat for the people in the United States. And this is not something that the citizens of the United States right now should be worried about. Okay, so. That was Fauci. That's Fauci. Now. That's a fucking disaster. So, so I'm saying to be reasonable and fair to the president mm -hmm. who's not a doctor, am I really going to say that if this guy was, seems to be acclaimed on all sides, mm -hmm. and, if, and if that's what the guy is saying behind closed doors that Trump was supposed to say, oh shit, I better get right on this. No, I, I don't, you know, I, you know, I, I I, I don't know. I, it's, it, I don't feel good about saying, as opposed to Cuomo, where it was all on the table. We knew it. You know, it's like it, you, you have other governors mm -hmm. reacting. You know, this is. And then the other way he kind of got lucky is that, although they were slow with the ventilators, we had to run out of ventilators. And you know, it's. I said this last week. There's this kind of idea in the law of but for causation where. Uh, you know, no harm, no foul. If, 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 if what you did didn't actually cause the damage, you're not on the hook. Now, I don't think that's the end of the story because if you take a gun and you point it at someone and you shoot it, but there's no gun in the chamber or you miss, yeah, you may not be guilty. You can't get sued for any damages, but you still did something very irresponsible. And maybe Trump was irresponsible in ordering the ventilators in time. Maybe he should have known. But in the end, he kind of lucked out because there was no gun in the chamber and it hasn't caused the disaster. As a matter of fact, I would, I, I, you know, I, I, I have nothing to do all day, so I'm reading stuff, but I'll show you guys this if it's interesting. Daniel Kahneman talks about, you know, the famous uh, scientist who writes about cognitive biases. There's a, bias, there's a bias called focalism, which he describes as nothing in life is as important as you think it is when you're thinking about it. And I think that's what the ventilators were. We spend so much time thinking about the ventilators we actually lost sight of the fact that very few people are saved by ventilators. And I, and I would guess, well, I don't know, that all the ventilators in the world would not save as many lives as if Cuomo had simply started the social distancing 12 hours earlier. And well, yeah. So, so, so I, don't think, I don't think anybody could say Trump has handled this well. And I won't even give him credit for the travel ban in China because that's just kind of his reflex. I, I, I don't like something, ban, you know, stop the travel. I, I don't, but at least he did it. But um, I don't see, and then finally, and then I'll, then I'll let you guys know. So, so Nate Cohn, who is a really, a writer I really respect in the New York Times, full disclosure, I know him a little bit, he comes to the olive tree, but this guy is a total nonpartisan um, statistical guy. And he has this article in the Times, I think it was yesterday, where he essentially, to try to figure out how America's doing, he, he c combines all of Europe from Germany to the West as one, you know, as one population, which is almost exactly the same size as America. And here, this is a response to this administrative state thing. These are all the European nations, the socialist, so social democratic nations that have very robust administrative states. And the end of the story is, we might be doing a little bit better than they are right now. We might end up doing a little worse, but it's neck and neck. There's no clear case to be made that, well, the, the countries that have the, this kind of ideology do any differently than the country. The authoritarian states may be doing better, but even, though I, even then, I don't think that's what it is. I think what it really is, is that the countries that have been through this before are, are a lot more ready to respond to it. If we have the same thing five years from now, I don't care if it's the most, I don't care if Bernie Sanders is president or you know uh, 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 Ted Cruz, I guarantee you we're gonna respond to it properly. Well, we, we've been vaccinated, not just literally, but figuratively. Yeah, and we, I think it's real, this is really not, 
an ideological issue. It is a partisan, it has, for certain commentators like the despicable Sean Hannity, and, and don't, don't call it conservatives because if you read the National Review and things like that, that's, they're not like that. But these people who carry water for Trump, notably not Tucker Carlson this time. Yeah, they were, they were just gonna parrot whatever the president said, but that's not ideological. If president said this was the worst thing ever, that's what Hannity would have been saying. You know, it's not like there was any, he was like, this is some conservative reflex to downplay a virus. I think that's just his sycophants. Um, but I don't, I, I find it hard to blame it on any ideology or political party. And I'm even ready to forgive Cuomo to tell you the truth. It just bothers me that they don't, you know, expose what he, the mistakes, but I, I don't hate the guy, you know? Yeah. What, what I would say is uh, I, in, in turn, I agree with you that countries with much better social safety nets have also failed to reckon with coronavirus. That's inarguable. Look at Sweden. Uh, Sweden's still not clamping down. That's the most liberal country yeah, there is. Right? Sweden's been a weird outlier. They, they've done a, very little, which is strange. I mean, other Ger Germany, for example, has had far less death. They, they've handled it very well. They have a very strong social safety net. Italy's a social safety net too. They've handled it quite poorly. Why have they so, had less death? What what could be the reason they had less death? Not, I, it's not the so treatment in the hospital. With, with, Ger with Germany, I, I, I think the key seems to be the countries that do better are those who are able to test very aggressively and quickly and early and isolate people. So That's they haven't. Really, so, yeah, but I got to stop you there. So they haven't had less death. Death. It's just they have a they have a bigger uh, denominator, so it, so the percentage goes down. If if we had included in our stats all the people who had very like Periel, very little symptoms, no symptoms at all, I have all, not had have very all, little all, symptoms. But yeah, but you'd have them impaired. To, all of a sudden, we'd have less death too. Periel, you you're not getting Probably, it. You right? got away with murder if you really had Corona. Yeah. You understand how, how how bad these symptoms can get? I, mean, I it, understand it, how it unless you that. unless somebody can make the case to me that hospitals are keeping people alive better in Germany than here, then I think what we're seeing is either reflections of the population, the 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 how congested their cities are, how many people they're testing. These are these are all different ways of distorting the statistical picture, but they're not actually changing. By the way, that by it's the way are, we, are, we, huh? are we confident? that Sweden is doing it wrong. Uh, it might, it, it's, is it still possible that when all is said I'm and done- I'm not confident that North Dakota is doing it wrong. I, I do think there's like, a, it's a hard sell for a state which has, which is huge and has as many people as Newark or something to say, no, because New York is in lockdown, you have to go in lockdown when almost nobody has it and we, and we live distant from each other all so, the time. So one, one rural country, sorry, country, one rural state that is getting hit fairly hard um, it, it, relative to its population is Idaho. If you read about Idaho right now, why they actually have a fairly high, it, it, it's, it seems like they've been very resistant to social distancing. There, there are people there who, um, there, there are elected officials who don't quite believe in it, who aren't doing it. Um, there hasn't been a terribly coordinated response as far as I can tell. I mean, it seems like the, the way to do this and to try to, to mitigate is to really come in early and hard on social distancing, on, on shutting things down and doing it aggressively early. And I would agree that that's the type of thing that defies ideology. You, you could be a Republican governor or executive and do it well, like Mike DeWine in Ohio has done. You can be a Democrat and do it well. You can be a socialist country and do it well. And you can be a, a more right-leaning country. Do you think, and do wow, it well. do you think oh. Sweden is headed for disaster or... I, I'm not an expert. I don't know. But my sense is from everything I've read, if you haven't taken this seriously up until now, you are probably heading somewhere bad. Another country that hasn't been terribly aggressive, surprisingly, is Japan. There's a decent article in the New York Times about that. Very recently, Japan has been slow to move to shut things down, um, unlike other other countries. So. <laughs> They, they, they could be headed somewhere too. I don't know. I mean, you, you, it's very hard to predict with this stuff. All you can do is judge in what's happened so far. And uh, all I would say is so far, you're looking at states that have handled this better. There are those who did the shutdowns earlier. It, it, California and Washington state have had less death and less carnage than New York. Some of that is density. There's no doubt density plays a role, but density is in everything. And density and average age. And, and, and pollution, pollution. Yeah. By the way, I'm looking at this. Just so, so he's right. So Idaho 
has 72 cases per 100,000 people, which is on par with Maryland, who is, which is 90. Ohio, which is a much, has big cities, is only at 44. What Tennessee is only 64. So yeah, I, Idaho is um, pretty significant there. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they, and, and the thing that what the scary thing with this virus is, I, I do think it's going to end up hitting poorer, more rural parts of, of the country pretty hard in that it's going to come slow. We know this is going to be probably a year long process, not in terms of maybe New York can lift some of the shutdown protocols, you know, and maybe in the next few months we'll see. Um, but this is something, you know, this may have two waves. The, the, the Spanish flu in 1918 had a, a spring winter wave and then came back in the fall uh, and winter again. It went away in the summer. So you're, you're talking about a virus that could have multiple waves and that's a, a, a scary thing too. And that's where the states who haven't taken it seriously so far may get hit very hard. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking about the Southeast in particular and these other rural states um, that so far are viewed as a New York problem, but you can't see coronavirus that way. It's, it's a worldwide problem. Some places may get, get hit harder than others, but everywhere is gonna get hit to some extent. And it's really about taking it seriously. Um, in, in terms of Trump, you know, messaging does go a long way. Taking it seriously early, saying we're going into a national shutdown. I, I go back to when he was saying we're all going to be in church on Easter Sunday, and it, it just wasn't true. And, and well, he didn't. He didn't. He, he didn't actually. He said he hoped. He hoped. I mean, yeah. It is, but there. Uh, I would, I, and this is this is, hasn't been only a Trump problem. Other executives too failed in this way. Yeah. You can't speak in. I, I hope it can happen by now. You have to say, look, this is bad. It's going to be bad for a while, and we've all got to sit at home and stay inside. And, and Trump's tone has changed on this, I think, because the Fauci's of the world have really drilled it into him. Well, because Fauci he also has to up. be very now, serious. Uh, by, by the way, but can, can we go back to what we saw? By the way, these are my kids. They were no, don't say they were very badly behaved tonight at Passover Seder, so they know that I'm mad at them. But yeah, uh, so we made you an apology bracelet. You made me an apology yeah. bracelet. You, you, you really did. Oh. That's very sweet. Look, I've never heard of an apology bracelet. Oh, you make that. I cry. haven't either. Mm-hmm. Mila, Mila's the one who made it. I don't. I didn't know. I don't know how to tie about bracelet. All right. Thank you very much. So, but uh, in a in a in a normal wait, world, wait, wait, slow down. What did they do? They just didn't shut up and they didn't listen. They kept getting up and they were. They Mommy were... called me stupid in the bed. Who called you stupid? She, she said no, it by accident. Oh, by accident. Stupid. Oh, someone's gonna get in big trouble. Um, I can't believe that you guys didn't behave. I don't believe that. Oh no, tell her. We did. You what? <laughs> you, you did, misbehaved. You misbehaved, yeah. What did you do? We, we, we talked by the player. Now, do you kids like uh, Passover better or Easter better? Easter. Um, Hanukkah. <laughs> uh, Hanukkah was Easter. one of the choices. Uh, you, get candy and you get to get um, the silly string thing. Okay, from now on for Passover, you get candy and silly string. Jewish holidays. I just want to say, go ahead. So, so, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it's Trump's personality. He's trying to put a positive spin on things. It's, it's, I, 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 I prefer Cuomo's more honest, delivery i know it's trump it's the salesman in him but i have to say sweetheart be careful i have to say that um the um, in an in a in a sane world if if the manny stop please if 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 trump got x level of news coverage for that easter quote and we know it was huge it will be 1000 x the fact that the Times says that cuomo's responsible for 80 percent of the deaths in new york you know like when I think of all the attention that, that that offhand Trump remark got, and I compare it to what really matters, about 80% of the deaths, I'm like, I see why people just tune out and watch Fox News. I get it. Like, they, they say that, you know, they just say that the media is not for me. They're not for me. Unless I'm on team hate everything Trump does, I'm, they're just leading me by the nose. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this, the, the Cuomo... Uh, in that article, the, the Tom Fried, Friedman quote on um, 
the uh, 50 to 80 percent i would have pushed that higher in the story or, or emphasized that a lot more put it that way uh, that, that, that should have gotten more play. i don't know you know what you guys i feel like you know cuomo might have made an error since the kids are there we'll say that made an error in the beginning and i'm not excusing that but he has been doing such a phenomenal job um I, well, know, bedside manner well, well, it's not just, but bedside manner, it's not just that, but bedside manner is also important, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. So I, I don't know, what, what is the value of decimating him in a New York Times piece? Like he- Because the New York Times is there to tell us the truth of what happened. But they did tell us the truth. Like They, that did, just they did today, like, they did today, but before that, the only person saying it was Ross. Honestly, I feel like that's like oh, I, 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 listen, I was, I was trying to make this case to all my friends are liberals and I was trying to make this case and I was sending like a national review article, uh, uh, I think market, there were, there were a few articles, uh, and they were just getting spat back in my face because the source was considered, you know, you, it was an ad hominem attack on the source rather than deal with the merits. And then when Ross's article came out and I said, look, this guy writes for the nation. All right. And then all of a sudden they had to engage me on the conversation. <laughs> All of a sudden, they couldn't. And all of a sudden, I was like, "All right, let's have him on." But wait, yeah. so it's like, if is it all of a sudden or all of the sudden? Huh? Is it all of a sudden or all of the sudden? All, all of a sudden. Of a sudden. Did I say all of the sudden? Uh. Because I wrote all of the sudden on Facebook recently, and then somebody corrected me and said, "No, it's all of a sudden." It's all yeah, of it a sudden. All of a sudden. Know. Okay, we uh, gotta wrap it up. Well, we, we should mention, Noam, that uh, uh, one of the Comedy Cellar comics, uh, we, uh, Vic uh, Henley, we died this week. Vic Henley, who was not of there. not of coronavirus. No, no, he died of a pulmonary um, embolism, which ironically is a lung-related thing, pulmonary. Yeah. But I don't believe in his case had anything to do with coronavirus. He died, as I understand it. Very, uh, he, he he was fine up until like the day before he died, and then he wound up in the ICU anyway. Um, and Michael Che's Michael Che's grandmother died of coronavirus. Of coronavirus, okay. And that, that that really that really bothers me. Um, How, how's Boris Johnson? Fair, huh? Right? How's Boris Johnson doing? I well, guess. Like I was saying, Hatem, our friend Hatem. So Ross says, no, we have a friend who been carrying around this briefcase thing. I wish I could remember what they're called that keep his heart beating. For two years, he's been carrying this waiting for a transplant. He finally, he was not doing well. And he went to the hospital and they finally, a transplant came through and they had to have him tested for coronavirus and the heart tested for coronavirus. They had to get a special dispensation from Washington. It was all, all kinds of things had to fall in place. They gave him the heart transplant. He's a week into his recovery. He's diagnosed with coronavirus. Oh, God. He contracted, oh, he contracted in, the, um, in the transplant ward. But... He seems to be doing okay, and they're giving him not hydro hydroxychloroquine, but they're giving him the remdesivir, the, the um, Ebola drug, mm -hmm. and they give it to him very early, which is when they say that that if it works, that's when it would need to be like, antivirals need to come early. And I speak to him every day, and he's okay, and his breathing is okay, and he's coughing a little bit, but I think he even said he's a little bit better yesterday than the day before, so he may pull through. It's a great story for a journalist. Really, if he pulls through, oh my God, or, maybe, or just to cover, is about a, a heart transplant victim who got it in the in the war because it really shows. It, it made me very skeptical of all these protocols that that you can do. You can go out as long as you do the following things and you won't catch it. Well, if they can't manage it in a heart transplant wing, then they're not that bulletproof. You know, like it's 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 hard to keep it. By the way, Mr. Dwarman, do you know that um, your president Trump owns stock in the company? Oh come uh, on! Um, hydro hydrochloroquine. You know that? Hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine. You know that? No, yeah, I don't. I don't believe. Uh, listen. You don't I, believe what? I tell you. I'll tell you what I think about that. If it's true. It is true. Okay. Okay, if it's true that Trump has real money in this company, yeah, and that you can make the plausible case that that's why he's um, uh, spoken favorably about the drug, that is a huge story of corruption. I get it. Oh, however, okay. however, I I own mutual funds and ETFs and whatever it is, and and very few people know what are in these holdings, and. 
it, unless he, he made some trades on it or whatever it is. For, let me tell you something. The New York Times is not covering correctly in my judgment, although very hypocritically, they're not covering these sexual allegations against Joe Biden. Now those sexual allegations, hear, hear me out, those sexual allegations that Joe Biden are corroborated by two people contemporaneously, her, her father and her, her, her brother and her friend, um, who probably saw it at the same time. And yet it's so serious that the Times doesn't feel they're ready to disseminate that information. The fact that Trump may have this stock somewhere in his portfolio is a much weaker accusation than the accusation against Joe Biden. And, and it gets reduced and weaponized into bite-sized tweets, which just add to the, the horrible political situation. And I'm not trying to cover for the man. If it's true, it's true. I have a feeling it's not gonna be true because so many of these stories go up in smoke. Turns out he wasn't a Russian spy either. And, and it, I think that'd be a lot of money for the Wait. president to do that. And then he'd have to sell it in time, whatever. But, and but, also hydroxychloroquine is a generic drug that a lot of companies make in the yeah, margins. And, also, and every doctor that I see on TV has been taking this drug and Cuomo has spoken uh, positively about the drug. So, you know- Did you see I, the piece just, about it in the Washington Post? Listen, I'm just, no, I, and I'll read it, but just don't jump to conclusions. What's, what's it say? The real reason- The real reason Trump is obsessed with hydroxychloroquine. Is it, is it One of the most bizarre and disturbing aspects of President Trump's nightly press briefings on the coronavirus pandemic is when he turns into a drug salesman. All right. I, I, like I said, the Washington Post had columns about how Trump is a Russian asset, whatever it is. I am not- He'll never oh, concede that I'm right. Well, because I want- How I, much I, money does he have to have in this stock for he, you to tell me? He needs to he needs to be aware of it, <laughs> which would which number one, and it needs to be, I don't know. It, it I would say it's got to be hundreds of like, I I, I just I have trouble. Oh, in, you probably own stock in that company as well if you have a mutual fund. It's very yeah, it's like, like there's no. I mean, maybe maybe it's true. I wouldn't put it past the guy. He, okay, but, I'll uh, take but, that. Uh, I'll take that. But but I'm making a bigger point, which is that they will they will jump the gun and report. A, a very damaging story about him on, sl Manny, stop, please. On, on slim, on, on a few fragments of evidence that, that, that everybody knows can be perfectly explainable in the way I'm doing it. But, if, way, it's, yeah. but if it's Biden, when they have more than a few fragments of evidence, they properly say, hold on a second. We, let's not jump to conclusions. This is a very serious accusation. All right, whatever. Let's That's check true. it out. And once Washington we check Post it out, down. then we can risk reporting it. So let them check it out. Let them do. The, let them. Let them be the same to everyone. And if it's true, I, it might even be impeachable to tell you the truth. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, did you read the Washington Post article that you just cited? Yeah. I, uh, it, does it say that the real reason is financial? I don't think it says that. Yeah. I thought it said that the real reason, in their estimation, was to save his presidency. So he gets credit if the drug works. And that he has a financial stake in the company. Wait, everybody stop for a second. Mila, can you read can I out loud? Can you read out no, stop to... talking for a second. Mila, yeah. what's it like to have your dad at home all the time? It's great. Oh, man. <laughs> what do you, what do you, got, what, you better... Everybody <laughs> 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 got a slap. <laughs> oh, my boy. Right, do you miss school, or would That's you rather right. be home, or would you rather be at school? Home school, but now since I'm actually trying to miss regular school. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Well, the glass is always green. being home all the time and not seeing your friends, probably. The thing is, is like I watch YouTube, so like, and I usually don't think about the coronavirus or anything. I don't think they were in quarantine. And then once I sit down and realize that one hasn't been going outside, and I really think about it, it's kind of it's amazing. Yeah, like, you shouldn't think about it too much. You should. You don't have to worry about that stuff. That's what we're here for. Okay, let's leave on this. On this. On well, does Addy, I mean, does, I did it again. Does Ross have any thoughts about hydroxy? Wait, I want to leave on, on this <laughs> screenshot from April 7th. What screenshot? I don't Washington know. Post, Trump's promotion of hydroxychlorine is almost certainly about politics, not profits, at least not his profits. 
All right, Periel. So all I'm saying is just breathe. Okay. Is that Bob Di Buono? That picture? Philip Bump. No. Um, I, 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 maybe Ross knows where Philip Bump is coming from. Is he a? He's, you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's one of their uh, White House uh, reporters. I, I don't. He's not a columnist. I don't. He's not a right wing. So let Ross weigh in here. What do you think? Um. It's a good question. I mean, I don't know a ton about, in, in terms of the drugs effectiveness, uh, truthfully, I don't know a, a ton about it. Um, it's an issue if he's making a profit. It's also true there is a nuance here with mutual funds. So um, I, it's a story I, I need to really, I think, do a bit more research to have like a hard take on. I would say on its face, yes, it's a bad, it's a bad look. Trump has had conflict of interest throughout his presidency probably violating the emoluments clause uh, of the constitution go, going going way back to kind of his uh foreign foreign uh, holdings so he definitely as president has created conflicts of interest on this particular matter it's something i would have to do a bit more research oh, on because well, it's found true the there, there's some there's some nuance on if it's a mutual fund how much money it is is well, it something he's well, aware of you know the, the these way, are things one, I wait, 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 everybody's like got to stop know. everybody's got to stop because yeah. i have to read it this is the thing, and, and I honestly, I knew this all along. No, I didn't. Um, in the problem with looking for smoking guns, of course, is that one tends to see a lot of gun shaped objects as guns and a lot of wisps as smokes. In this case, the Times story mentions Trump's personal stake in the sixth paragraph of the story titled Trump's Aggressive Advocacy, blah, 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 suggests that the paper's own reporters don't really think that the motivation was financial. From key investment, Trump profits on promoting coronavirus drug is a much catchier story, but it's not reinforced by the data. At issue is a fund of a firm called Dodge and Cox, uh, called cleverly enough the Dodge and Cox International Stock Fund. Wait for it. Trump's personal financial disclosure indicates that he holds shares. Uh, that said, only 3.3% of the fund's holdings are in that company. What's more, Trump's disclosure filed in May shows that the three trusts each hold between $1,000 and $15,000 in the fund. In other words, Trump's stake in each trust is between $33 and $400. So come on now. All right. It, it's Are you going to learn your lesson Smaller now? potatoes. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's not a story that I've myself promoted or, or done a lot of research on. So yeah, I mean, there are a lot, there are a lot of, ev there's evidence for, for there, there are many things in terms of Trump corruption you can go after. This may need, it may not be the thread that you latch onto. There are other, other things, but yeah, I, um, that was, that was my sense of it. Again, I'd like to do a little more research, but if it's a mutual fund, I, the amount of money, you know, I, I it's, do it it's not the, perhaps the, not the most damning thing. Of, of also, it's presence. certainly possible for no, can okay. promote a drug because one believes in the drug and it so happens one also stands to profit, but, I, I, but, it, but it's something, listen, you guys, I think, I think you're missing the point. No, we get it. It's not financially no, motivated. The, point the, po the real point of this is the opposite, which is that what is going wrong in our media where clearly if this is a $33 to $400 holding, that is not the reason he's doing this, clearly. No, I mean, obviously. Yet, this is a story that is spreading like a virus, not, not on, uh, you know, Alex Jones, but through major newspapers and, and their reporters tweeting it when it can't possibly be true and they're doing tremendous damage to their credibility. Obviously the people who hate Trump don't care what they say and they'll never leave them. Say anything you want. But to swing voters and to and swing voters and right, this is going to get Trump reelected. They are they are making it so that people like I, like me, my eyes, my eyes glaze over when I hear these stories about Trump, not because I believe anything great about Trump. It's just how many times are you going to tell me these st bullshit stories? How many reporters are going to tweet this nonsense and, and have to walk it back? Aren't they? I mean, how does the New York Times get involved with reporting a story implying that Trump is corrupt here when it's 33 to $400? What the, have, they, have they lost their, everything about their ethics? You can't, you can't defend it. What is a dodging cock? Dodge and Cox. That's the name of the mutual fund. All right. On that note, listen, <laughs> Ross, you're a really good guest, and we should get you on again if you want. If it wasn't too painful. Yeah. No. This this was good. This I had was a, a lot very, of fun with very, this. Very very non comedy seller oriented episode. I hope the listeners enjoyed it. Uh, <laughs> 
And when the comedy cellar opens up again, as long as you have a mask, I'd love to, to meet you in person and have you. Sounds in. good. I, I will come with a mask. We'll do By that. The way, and, and I know him. He's a very young. He's, I don't know if I'd call him a kid necessarily, but he's 30 years old, this guy. Ross? He made yes, it to 30. Very, very, very young. Very young. A bit of a wonder kid, perhaps. Uh, he's also a novelist. He wrote Demolition Night, yeah. Demolition Night. Night, yeah. Yes, yes, I did. Which is a thriller or something? Uh, no, it's literary fiction with some science fiction elements, I would say. Kind of very soft sci-fi uh, literary fiction. Uh, a, a sort of a satire of uh, technology and, and uh, our, you know, sort of Google and, and a, 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 a Facebook obsessed world and, and also it facilitates between the 1970s and, and the the near future um so you know something of a, of a satire of uh a lot of the crap we deal with every day you know there, there's some violence in there some time travel um but you know also you know, work of literary fiction as well so you know if you're into like Ray Bradbury Thomas Pynchon Octavia Butler those sort of writers sort of in that's that impressive space. Uh, um, you, you know the writer Harry Enten from CNN. You know Harry Enten. I, I know. I know of Harry through Twitter. Yeah, I do. So Harry, Harry's a really good friend of mine and of of the the show. Maybe some. Um, uh, maybe someday you guys. Harry comes to the Comedy Cellar for free food a lot. Okay. Harry, Harry and I, really I like free food, so I'll, I'll take free food. There's there's another guy you should probably you probably I I know you'll disagree with him, but he's he's also very young and very impressive. His name's Coleman Hughes. Um, I don't know, I don't know him. What's that? Oh, I don't know him. Who who is he? Google him, Coleman Hughes. He he's a sure. He's not he's not conservative. Actually, he's actually pretty liberal. But he's 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 a um, he's a, uh, a a a contrarian on racial issues. He's black. Okay. And, he, and he's he just graduating from Columbia this year, and he's already writing for Colette, okay. Wall Street Journal, um, uh, a bunch of other important publications. Um, you should look him up. You, I, I'd like you to meet him. Too. Yeah, I, I definitely will. I, you I, I enjoy him, debate. You'll like him. What's yeah, that? no, I, I enjoy debate. I have conservative friends, so I'm not, I, don't, I don't shy away from that stuff. So curious yeah, to read his stuff. I said that, um, that Harry Anton gets to eat for free at the Comedy Cellar doesn't necessarily mean that you will. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. I may have to earn it. Harry, Harry's got a bigger following than me, so maybe he, he can have I the guess free food. I'll work my way there. Free food. You're the you're Gnome's kind of a guy. He likes to surround himself with oh, intellectuals. Yeah, so I like I like smart people who, who who like to argue without, but but don't but like like enjoy it like not as as a as a bonding thing in a way as opposed to a yeah. nasty thing. Somebody sent me a trip a clip of Tracy Morgan on I think it was the Today Show. Talking about um, being in quarantine. Did you see that, Noam? The Howard no. Stern show. It well, we'll Howard. play. We'll play. It, we'll play it on Saturday. It was, it was tremendous. On, uh, it was you on Howard Stern. It. it was on Stern. You mean it, was it wasn't? You mean Stern aired it? Yeah. But it wasn't. The clip is from the Today Show, I think. Oh okay. no! Stern was interviewing him. Gentlemen, oh. we got, we gotta wrap it up. I gotta. It's Har at nine thirty. I had to be upstairs reading Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Wait a second, Our Ross. Where can everybody follow you? Where can they? You follow can you? my my Twitter handle. It's just at Ross Barkin. So R O S S B A R K A N, not I N like Ellen Barkin, but Barkin like myself. Um, follow me on Twitter. Uh, my website Ross Barkin. Again, my name Ross Barkin dot com column in the guardian and in the nation i, I contribute to other outlets as well uh, columbia journalism review new york magazine um are you Gothamist. a commie sorry are you a commie my commie i would say i'm a socialist well, i wouldn't say i'm a communist all right yeah, i'm saying i'm a socialist I, I would you, support say. you would support stern Sam? might have aired it stern might have played a clip but the clip i'm talking about is from the today show Okay. okay yeah. Good night. I got to take my kids. Good night, everybody. Ross, it's a pleasure meeting you. Joy, this was fun. Harry, I'll feel See better. Happy Passover. Feel better. Chag Happy Samaya. Passover uh, as well. Now, Dan, say where they can follow us. A comedy the podcast at comedycellar dot com. For we haven't had comments in a while. We like your comments, and this episode was a very heavy, 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 <laughs> uh, serious non-comedy related <laughs> episode. So please let us know what you think about it. And uh, us on, on Saturday, we're having Kyle Dunnigan, uh, a, a uh, Instagram celebrity of sorts. So it'll be a little lighter, I think, uh, and the next follow episode. Follow us on Instagram at Live From The Table.
And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Ross Barkin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye. -bye.